You are listening to Heroes Never Die, your one-stop spot for all the latest news, Overwatch League results, and mishaps in Overwatch. Here are your hosts, Totally Drunk and Edinar. What is up, guys, and welcome back to Heroes Never Die, your one-stop spot for all things Overwatch. I am your host, and tonight on episode 126, we're going to discuss the latest in Overwatch and Overwatch Esports. Uh, we'll take a look at the Nano Cola Challenge, what's been going on with the current support meta, the Dynasty makes some more adjustments to their coaching staff, and of course we will take a look back at last weekend's All-Star Weekend festivities. But before we can get into the news and introduce you to my co-host, I just want to take a moment to thank all of our repeat listeners, and of course, thank everyone that is staying out with us tonight during our live show, which is actually, you know, an hour earlier, because uh, there's something else kind of going on tonight, which we'll talk about. Uh, but anyways, as you can tell, Edinar actually is here tonight, uh, despite, you know, what I thought leaded into the show. You know, there was a good chance we might not even be streaming right now, but we are. Uh, so Edinar, good to see that you're not completely flooded uh, because I know that there has been a lot of rain, really just across the Midwest. But I know you guys have been getting hit pretty bad. Yeah, it's been it's been pretty bad up here. Uh, I think uh, we're worried because we got crazy amounts of rain, like five six days ago. I think we got twelve inches in under twenty four hours. So we got a foot of rain in under twenty four hours, and then everything was still flooded. And then we're supposed to get another like six inches yesterday. Uh, somehow in Madison, it was like Moses partying the clouds and all the massive storms like stopped just short of Madison, like went around. I'm just like, you know what? I'm going to take it. I lost internet uh, until uh, a few hours ago, but I mean, I still had power. So I'm, assu I'm assuming some something got flooded, which took out the internet. I don't know. But uh, yeah, no, I'm glad to be here. Glad to not be half underwater i mean it was a figure of mine <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah for sure uh so honestly it's been kind of like a quieter week all like all across overwatch really you know there was the all-star weekend uh so a lot of the attention was kind of put on that but we do have an update in regards to diva because really like diva this past week has kind of taken center stage. Obviously, you know, we talked about Overwatch's latest animated short that dropped last week, uh, you know, between the, you know, South Korea Fan Expo and Gamescom. Uh, so we got Shooting Star, and we got our first glimpse at, you know, a skin that they were hinting at for Nano Cola, and uh, we're actually going to be able to unlock the skin in-game as part of this challenge that is currently going on right now. So how can you earn this Nano Cola skin. Well, all I have to do is play the game, pretty much. Uh, you get it by winning nine Overwatch matches, which can be done in either a quick play, competitive play, or, you know, do it in the truest mode, arcade mode on random heroes, which is what I've been doing uh, on all of my Smurf accounts. Uh, but anyways, you have until September 10th to unlock the skin. And then, along with the skin, they also added Nano Cola sprays. Uh, so, you know, you'll be getting a couple of those along the way. Uh, some of them will be rewarded at three wins, as well as six wins. And then, you know, the cosmetics just don't stop there, because they're also doing some Twitch stream stuff as well to earn additional Diva sprays. All you have to do is watch participate in Twitch streamers that have the Twitch drop enabled. Uh, so we had Seagull kicking things off yesterday. Uh, that's Tuesday, August 27th. And uh, I found out in his stream pretty much all day. He had more than 100,000 viewers during his peak. You know, we saw Jeff Kaplan stop by when he hit 100k, which is pretty cool. And really, that stream was just popping throughout the entirety of the day. And each day of this challenge, they are going to have a different streamer spotlight. So be sure to take a look at the full schedule. But, like, it doesn't matter if it's during those hours. As long as you are on, you know, one of those streamers' channels, you will be earning, you know, that cumulative uh, time to unlock the spray. So you don't have to be there specifically in their time window, which is good to know. Uh, so, you, you know, you have a couple of... Uh, couple of weeks to unlock all of this, and you don't have to do it all in one sitting or anything like that. Uh, but you will get one spray awarded after watching two hours of the participating streams. 
with more sprays being unlocked at 4, 6, and 8 hours. So, as per usual, guys, just make sure that your Blizzard account is linked to your Twitch account in order to obtain the sprays. And I have to say, Ed, like, you know, it's Diva. We expected cutesy type sprays, and that is exactly what we got. These sprays are actually pretty amazing. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the sprays are pretty cool. Uh, I I actually have a good chunk of them already. Because, like, what, what you said, Siegel kicked it off yesterday, hit 100,000, uh, which was insane. Because, yeah. Um, so I got, I think I had six hours now. Not going to lie, I was not paying attention the whole six hours. <laughs> but I had it up for six hours. Um but yeah, so I got a good chunk of the sprays. I think I just need two more hours of watching probably Seagull or somebody who has drops enabled. But they're pretty cool skins. I have pretty cool sprays. I like the skin the most. Mm -hmm. uh, the skin is probably my favorite Diva skin um, that they have. And I've I've been, I don't know, critical of a lot of her skins <laughs> because it's just like none of them are like, eh. They're just like retreads, a lot of them were. So this skin is actually pretty awesome. Um, so I'm excited to get that. But like you said, a true player won't do it in comp, won't do it in quick play. A true player will get it through Mystery Heroes. A true player. Absolutely. I mean, not only will you unlock, you know, the skin, but you also get all of your loot boxes out of the way during the reset, so... That is definitely the way to do exactly. it. Exactly. Uh, it's like, it's a win-win. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, on top of that, you know, as I mentioned last week, they did put pre-orders up for the Figma figure of the Diva uh, Nanocola one, which also mm -hmm. ties in with the animated shorts. So really, like, you know, last week we talked about how, like, basically they just compiled a bunch of stuff into one, and this is really the first time where they've really branched out all in, like, one sort of theme, which is great to see and uh in regards to the diva skins like you know i'm still so waiting on that uh that diva rella one that was the fan art one you know they gotta they gotta turn that into one with a pumpkin mecca it needs to happen <laughs> i maybe <laughs> maybe i feel after this they need to cool down on diva a little and concentrate on someone else like torbjorn like Torbjorn, mm -hmm. or I don't know anyone else. <laughs> like literally except, anyone, <laughs> except except Mercy. Mercy has gotten like a lot lately. Uh, I think they need to 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 worry about like Widowmaker. Maybe some Widowmaker love. I don't know. <laughs> Arissa, some Arissa love. Something like that. You know, out, outside of puppy love. Yes, I like characters I play. How about that? That's all I ask. Is <laughs> that really asking for that much? No. I don't think so. Just look at my <laughs> most played heroes, Blizz, and be like, that's who we're going to concentrate on next. Well, you know what I'm going to concentrate on next? Competitive Season 12, because, uh, yeah, Season 11 came to a close, so we're going to jump into our hot community topics so, Season 11 is done with, and Season 12 is going to be kicking off in just a couple of days. Uh, so, Season 12 kicks off on August 31st at 5 p.m. Pacific Time. Uh, so, just three days after the end of Season 11. So, with everything kind of, like, going down the past couple of weeks, um, it's been fairly hectic around here. And because of that, I haven't really had the chance to really dabble in competitive throughout all of Season 11. And I didn't even do my placements. Uh, so hopefully, you know, in these upcoming weeks, you and I can just duo queue our placements together. We'll get it out of the way on, you know, some of the Saturday night streams. Once, mm -hmm. you know, I get back to actually doing those uh, and not just, you know, dicking around in the arcade, which is amazing. I mean, don't get me wrong, uh, but I need to at least see how the support changes are going to affect where I'm placing, just because there's been some pretty big shifts in regards to the current support meta, which we'll definitely talk about. Uh, but Season 11, you know, Ed, did you actually finish your placements? Did you do them on, like, your Smurf account or anything like that? And if not, like, do you have anything uh, in the works in regards to this upcoming season? Uh, that is a big fat no. I'm finishing my placements. 
It's just every time I want to go finish my placements, I'm like, do I want to solo queue this? Because I know what's going to happen is I'm going to be like, okay, I'm going to have to heal. And I'm just like, uh, and then if I heal, can I trust the other people on my team? Like, I want to duo queue so I can at least have one other person I trust playing with me. Um, and then it's just, it's summer. I just, there's a lot of stuff going on. Like, after tonight, I think I am busy every night for the next six nights. Like, just going out and doing something. You know, I'm going, I have a fantasy football draft. Uh, you know, I have concerts I'm going to. Stuff like that. It's Labor Day weekend. So, it's just, it's the summer schedule where, I mean, fewer people are playing the game. Fewer people are playing ranked at night and stuff like that. So, yeah, no, I was not able to, and I think this is the first season I didn't even finish my placements. So, yeah, I'll get back to it, though. I'll probably get back to it on um, at least one of my accounts, the one that we'll, love, uh, we'll do our placements together on, my Hondo account. Hondo, greatest Star Wars character I've ever of all time. <laughs> so I took two things away from what you just said. One, <laughs> the fact that you actually trust me. <laughs> And two, the fact that you don't trust the LFG system in regards to queuing for competitive. I <laughs> I am skeptical of it. Um, I, I'm skeptical of solo queuing. Mm -hmm. uh, um, just because... Now, granted, now, I could use the new LFG system. That's something like I never fully have gotten into. And I, I mean, I used it a little bit, and I actually liked it when I used it. It's just not something that, I mean, I guess Blizz could, like, make it more aware. Like, it's it's not, like, truly, like, in your face, like, solo queuing, you, you know, pop up. Are you sure you don't want to queue up with a group type of thing? Maybe have something pop up. I don't know. Get that out there more than just like okay there's a small grayed out button on the bottom of the screen that you can click yeah they they need the it's dangerous to go alone pop up <laughs> yeah. you're like are you sure you want to do this like discord if you take everyone there's a message are you sure you want to do this in cop are you sure you want a solo queue like all right i guess <laughs> so yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to it though. I I do enjoy, as much as I complain about comp, I do enjoy comp. I know I'm a sick individual. <laughs> I I don't know why I do, but I just do. But like, comp just it it tilts you, it tilts you more than anything else. Like you can get rolled over in a quick play match, and you're just like, oh, that sucked. But then like you get one loss in your placement, and you're like. I'm about ready to punch a baby dolphin in the face type of angry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not oh, that I've punched a baby dolphin in the face, but I've had the thought a couple of times. The real question <laughs> is, would it, you know, slap you with its fin before you could get the punch off or not? Well, that's why you have to go after the baby dolphin. <laughs> <laughs> because you it can't wouldn't go after know a better. Grown. Yeah, they wouldn't know better. Like, so if I ever come visit you, don't take me to the Shed Aquarium. <laughs> well, at least like, they'll be behind, behind glass. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Although, there are some games where I could be tilted enough to just cl climb in. Mm -hmm. Be like, a few baby dolphin, and then just jump in the tank. Wow, that got dark real quick. <laughs> this is what comp can do to me. Yeah. So... <laughs> Right. <laughs> I just, I just can't. I'm like, all, all I'm thinking about now is punching a baby <laughs> dolphin in the face. And so, all right, next topic, well, we got to move on. Moving on to another thing that the community is talking about, we we got to talk about the support changes that you know recently dropped along with patch 1.27. Uh, so this is something that I wanted to touch on last week, but, you know, there's kind of a lot of stuff going on last week. So I'm like, you know what? It's still relevant. We'll, we'll hold it off a week, uh, and then we'll, you know, touch base with it yet again. So, as we know, patch 
1.27 brought several changes to the support heroes, you know, outside of Zenyatta, because uh, he was the only one that didn't see any changes at all. Uh, so, you know, we got the Mercy throughput nerfs. Anna, Lucio, and Moira receive some buffs. And the latest Omnic meta analysis takes a look at how those changes affected what we're seeing with the supports in the game. So, despite the throughput nerf to Mercy, Anna is still below Mercy in healing done per 10 minutes on average. Uh, we do see that Lucio's healing is competing well with some of the other healers after his aura radius was increased. And Moira's actually claimed the top spot in between the ranks of Platinum through Grandmaster with her recent buffs. Uh, but it was really Lucio that made the biggest jump in regards to his actual healing because he's seen a plus 12% healing increase across the tiers of play. And, you know, a lot of people were pretty worried about what the state of Mercy was going to be because it looked like she was going to be getting like a 16% nerf in regards to her healing throughput, which was actually not the case. What we're seeing is it's actually 8%, uh, which is, you know, pretty drastic, you know, compared to that 60% uh, than what we're expecting. So uh, we have seen that Mercy players are having to focus more so on their healing targets than actually using that right click because her damage boost usage is down pretty drastically uh, at about 24% across all tiers of play. So, you know, that uh, that throughput nerf with her healing is definitely affecting uh, how she's actually having to approach the game. So we're seeing a lot more mercies having to hold that left click down and not quite getting the damage boost out. Uh, and, you know, like part of that too is like, you know, with all the Hanzo changes we've seen lately, we haven't really seen the burst. Uh, with the Storm Arrows and, like, the damage-boosted Dragons combo that would always eat through the Transcendence, you know, because mm -hmm. that's not really a thing anymore. Uh, but, you know, it's been interesting because at the higher levels of play, we have seen Anna overtaking Mercy as the most picked support. And then we've also seen a little bit of fall-off from Zenyatta uh, with players favoring Lucio over Zenyatta. So, all in all, there's been some pretty big shakeups to the support meta uh, these past couple of weeks, and Brigitte just across the board has remained to be one of the more balanced, uh, you know, win rate support heroes in the game across all tiers. And, you know, despite, you know, the impact on Brigitte, Mercy, and Anna at the lower levels of play, uh, you know, they're a little bit lower than, uh, you know, some of the other supports, but just across the board, we're seeing a lot more balance throughout all of the support heroes, which you really haven't seen as of yet. Yeah, I, you're seeing a lot more balance. The one that actually I think they still need to work on more, and uh, and this may sound crazy because she's really started to up her usage, is Anna. I think Anna needs to be worked on, because like the thing that jumped out to me is if you look at the win rate of, uh, of the healers, mm -hmm. Everything's fairly, you know, like when you're looking bronze to grandmaster, there's just a steady, nothing too drastic of an incline, except when you go, get to Anna. Like it, it, the skill gap for Anna is dr so drastic. So, like, the win rate for Anna in grandmaster is the highest win rate of any support in the game at what is that like 57 percent, whatever so above 55 percent her win rate is about eight to ten percent lower in bronze than any other support she has a 40 percent or less win rate and that is just drastic difference between the two because like if you take lucio the win rate for him is between 48 and 53 between the two or you know what i mean mm -hmm. something not as drastic but to go from 40 to above 55 that's too drastic of a all right this when you see something like that as a dev you're like okay we need to straighten that out a little um and it's not like you don't nerf her and you don't truly buff her maybe you do something that makes her less super skill intensive um, I, I, you could do something, even something like, God, increase the radius of her sleep dart or do something with how her healing works, like how her heals do like 
something that's not going to make her crazy overpowered in, you know, Diamond Master, Grandmaster, but will up her win rate in Bronze, Silver, and Gold. Because that's what they really need to do with her to make her, like, a more balanced character, which is what they truly want to do with all characters, is just get them to be the most balanced characters possible. Like, if they could have even win rates across the board on every level with every hero, that's the ideal word, world right there. Um, you did talk about the rise in the Lucio. You saw the rise in the, the Moira. Uh, well, I mean, my, uh, Moira is like, you know, the healing output. She's got the most. And I blame this on one GD thing. And it's one thing I despise. Goats. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's kind of also hate... why there's a lot of Lucio. Yes, exactly. So you got Lucio, Moira, Uptick. Oh, weird. What's also super popular? That's possibly the worst thing in the sport in the game right now. Oh, goats. Mm -hmm. They use them both. Like it's just one of those things. Like I, I hate that team. I don't care if that team is the best team in contenders next year. I, I hate them. Like I think I would hate them if they became the Chicago Overwatch League network, uh, Overwatch League team. <laughs> like that's how much I hate Goats Comp. Um, but yeah, that's why you're seeing I think the uptick in the the usage rate and the healing done from Lucio and Mario. You're just seeing more Goats Comps out there. Like because every time you're getting stalled and you can't make it through, what's everyone's suggestion? Let's go Goats. Because it is easy uh, clap, that's why. But, yeah, you, you, but you nobody know, wants to play goats. You, you know what does great against goats though? Anna mm. with that bio, with that bio name. <laughs> exactly. But I, I, weird uh, how her usage rate in Grandmaster is through the roof, and Grandmaster uses goats a lot. Weird. But like every time somebody in chat, you don't want to be the person in chat. To be like, let's go goats. Because then you can just hear the sigh from everyone else in your group. <laughs> You're just like, oh, god damn it. We have to go goats, don't we? Dang it. But that is one of the few times I can actually play Brigitte. Yes. Um, I like the, the fact that Mercy has kind of come below in one of the supports. And I like that Zenyatta has kind of leveled up a little. Um like, because Mercy and Zen, they were too crazy by nerfing them. And this is a, an example of what they can do. It's like they nerfed them, but they didn't nerf them to the ground. They nerfed them a little. But they still made them super. They're both super viable. It's just they're not overpowered. Um, I don't think there's any supports right now. This is probably the first time I can think of where, like, they're all the supports are viable. Mm -hmm. Like there's not like one support, like, oh god, they're throwing. Anna used to be that support. Like you're on Anna. Why and, are you throwing? And then Moira. Yeah, and then Moira. And now <laughs> Moira Moira's gotten better. And I mean, mm -hmm. she there's nothing they did drastic with her. It's just, you know, they run goats or and she can actually heal more now because of the changes to her without having to do more damage and yeah, it's just the support group as a whole is in a very good spot right now. The only thing is the Anna. They could balance her out a little more between Bronze and Grandmaster. Yeah, but that's the thing, because she's so, like, aim-driven that I don't know how exactly they would do that. Because, uh, like, if you increase the radius of, like, her Bionade, that would just make it too easy to hit uh, on both yeah. sides of the field, really. Uh, but, you know, Zenyatta not really seen any changes you know basically tells you like Zenyatta's in a pretty good spot uh but you know with Mercy seeing the dip of play that also means that we're seeing a lot less people suffering from Jonak syndrome uh because there's less Mercy's pocketing Zenyatta's in the games now so that is also a thing uh but anyways let's go ahead and let's let's shift gears as we go inside the Overwatch League uh so first up we have a new multi-year deal with the Overwatch League and the social media network, Twitter. Uh, so, we don't know the terms of this deal, because uh, those were not disclosed, but this is a multi-year content deal. So, the deal began with the All-Star Weekend, so we got to see some near real-time video highlights, and also some livestream content added to Twitter. 
So, this is, you know, uh, this is something that's kind of, like, already in place between Twitter and some other uh, companies as well. Like, I know Activision has it for Call of Duty. Uh, ESL has it for their Intel Extreme Master series. And with the start of the second season, the Overwatch League's weekly preview show, Watchpoint, will be moved into Twitter, and that will be streamed live on the Overwatch League Twitter account. So, all in all, like, we, we got to see, like, a ton more, uh, you know, highlights during the entirety of the All-Star Weekend. So, honestly, like, I'm really liking this deal because of how much content there actually was. Because traditionally, like, if you go back and you look at the Overwatch League Twitter, uh, we didn't quite see the extensive use of these highlights or, you know, clips in general or top plays, whatever. There were a lot more, uh, like... <sighs> There was more of a drought between the content, uh, but with this deal in place for the All-Star Weekend, there was stuff hidden constantly throughout each of the series, each of the maps, each of the game modes, which is great to see, and I'm hoping that's definitely going to put a lot more eyes on these Twitter accounts, and, you know, it just, it can't all be fun and memes with the Overwatch League teams. We need to see the plays, we need to see the highlights, and uh, there was something posted from the Gladiators today which I thought was hilarious, and that was uh, Shit Sure For Says. I don't know if you actually saw that on the LA Gladiators. I did see that. Yeah. Uh, so definitely check that out. It is worth a watch. Uh, but I love that we're getting the additional content. I just wish that uh, the Twitter encoder was a little bit better with the video player, but you know, I know not everyone has had issues with that per se, but I know on my end I have had issues in the past with it. So hopefully that is cleaned up just a little bit, but you know, it's a new partnership more money being brought into the league and that is always a good thing for the growth of the league yeah no it's yeah I, like i said bringing in giant companies like twitter is kind of a big deal uh i mean it's just it's good for for good for the league something that big i agree with you though that i mean i've never sat down and watched anything at length mm -hmm. on twitter like video i've seen clips you see like you know 10 20 second clips here and there that I don't have a problem with. Uh, but I can see it becoming a problem if it's over like two, three, four minutes. Which, like, if you're trying to watch an actual match on Twitter, that could become an issue. Like, the live streaming aspect, or the near live streaming, as they call it, uh, with this. But, I, I mean, I don't see it being a, a huge problem. Just because it's not like this is the first time Twitter's done something like this like you said you know they do it with like call of duty other games stuff like that um so this is just probably the most high profile one they've worked with so maybe they're working out some kinks and are doing this um you know doing all this but you know i don't know i i that is way too technical for me <laughs> <laughs> way too technical as long as it works you're okay with it. Mm-hmm. All right, we'll move it on. So during the All-Star Weekend, we uh, had the Dennis Havulka Award, which was given to the player who has made a positive impact on the community. Uh, of course, uh, this was to honor the... Ter well, just honor the person. That was Dennis Havulka, a.k.a. Internet Hulk, who is a former Team Envy player who had passed away in November of last year at the age of 30. Uh, and Hulk was just known for his impact on the community, uh, being a longtime player of competitive Overwatch, really, since the beginning of the days. And the award was given to none other than the Dallas Fuel Flex Tank player, Mickey. So, I like this was really not a surprise by any stretch of the imagination. No. Mickey was recruited to Envy after the World Cup in 2016. And, you know, Mickey has always kind of been that, you know, beacon of light on what was an otherwise kind of dim-lit Dallas Fuel season, because Dallas Fuel had a lot of problems, a lot of issues throughout the entirety of the inaugural season. Obviously, you know, they had some issues with some of their main tanks, whether it's suspensions or whether they were saying shit that they shouldn't, you know. Taimu got in some trouble for some things that he said on stream. Uh, they lost effect to, you know, he was dealing with some stuff mentally that he needed to take care of. Uh, you know, they also 
were experimenting with role swaps, and they brought Siegel in to be, you know, basically learn Diva, and he had a very good impact. You know, they had Mickey on Brigitte, who looked pretty damn promising. You know, they uh, they got rid of Kai Kai. They brought on Arrow from the, uh, you know, the Fusion University. Uh, and we saw a huge turnaround from the Dallas Fuel in Stage 4. And, you know, this is a very interesting team to watch because they've kind of already gone through it all except really, like, having a really good performance in the stage. But, like, you can tell that the pieces are there. And... Mm -hmm. They have an awesome coach and staff now, and I'm really anxious to see where they're going to go from here. But Mickey, you know, he was recruited by Hulk to be on Team Envy, and Mickey was really, like, the first uh, kind of, like, foreign player on Envious to, you know, join that team. And then, you know, they would go on to win Apex, and then, you know, the rest is pretty much history. You know, Dallas Fuel approach Envy. Uh, they signed them, and, you know, later on we saw the return of Team Envy, you know, in Contenders and all of that. Uh, but, you know, this was just part of the All-Star Weekend festivities. Really not surprised. And, you know, it's it's hard not to watch Mickey and then not have a smile on your face because his smile is really infectious. And, you know, we, we've seen him do it all. You know, we, we've seen him, you know, work uh, as a reporter. You know, he cast, he was on the desk during the All-Star Weekend at times. And, you know, he plays a pretty... Pretty good Tifa, as long as he's not, you know, trying to figure out whether or not he needs to, you know, protect Tank Mu or protect AKM, who's on a non-meta hero. <laughs> For three minutes and 43 seconds. Well, um, I, was, I was talking more so about his soldier days, not so much uh, like the um, yeah, no, I mean, for all of this, I think Mickey was the obvious choice. There, there could have been others. I know... Internet Hulk had a huge impact on Taimu's life. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, I think the story goes at the beginning, Taimu was actually a support player. And then Internet Hulk saw his aiming abilities and told him he needed to switch. And that's when he switched over to DPS and then became, you know, the Taimu we all come to know and sometimes love and uh, you know it, it's just like Taimu would have been the only other one that I think would have been been about this but like I think going on for years in the future when they give out this award it's going to be less like this was more of a ceremonial we want to give the award to somebody who it it means the most to like most significant to and that was Mickey. Down the stretch, they might give it to somebody else that maybe didn't wasn't directly impacted by Internet Hulk type of thing. But um, yeah, no, I think Mickey. I mean, Mickey was the obvious choice. I mean, I have my own thoughts on whether Mickey will be with the Dallas Fuel next year, but uh, my thoughts are no. And um, but like, it's good to have him out there because honestly, everyone's just happy. To see Mickey. Like he's another one of those that could be on the announce table. Mm -hmm. Not not like as like calling matches like you know with you know Doa, you know, and Monty. Like not one of them, but like he could be on the table with Puckett and stuff like that, and he'd be a good, you know, commentator there. Like, you know, like him, you know, we had Custa. Mm -hmm. You know, those are the kind of guys who, like, you can see easily transitioning over to a more, you know, announcer type of uh, level. Custa, obviously. Custa is a, a little bit away, ways away because he is one of the better healers in, in Overwatch League presently. Uh, but Mickey is just the most likable person you've ever seen. Like, yeah, it's just how can you not love Mickey? Plain and simple. So he embodied what they wanted to uh, like have come across when they gave out this award for the first time. So couldn't have been a better person. You know, it's awesome. I loved it. Absolutely. So we do have an update on uh, the Soul Dynasty in regards to their coaching staff. Uh, so, you know, last week we discussed, you know, a certain London Spitfire coach having parted ways with the team. Uh, so, you know, Dynasty are kind of going through, like, a rebuild right now. Uh, previously, they added KDG from Snakes. 
Uh, so he's surfing as the head coach. You know, we saw them pick up Fisher from the LA Gladiators. And now the Dynasty have brought on Train, who, you know, as we mentioned, was on the London Spitfire last year. Uh, so Train will be serving as the team's assistant head coach. Again, KDG serving as the team's head coach. And what what I love about this, as I as, as I mentioned, was, you know, Train had joined the Spitfire, uh, you know, when GC Busan was signed to the franchise ahead of that inaugural season. And this was a team that had had beaten the, you know, that Dynasty core roster of Lunatic Kai uh, and just really gave them a world of trouble and bested them in 14 straight maps, uh, kind of like going through Apex and then eventually into the Overwatch League before, you know, the Dynasty could finally get that one win over that London core. And man, was that was a stretch. Because every time I saw the uh, the lineup, as you know, I saw it with Seoul going up against London, my heart just sank. Like, I was like, 4 <laughs> Like, Like, it, it hurt me to say that, because for one, I, I've seen it play out multiple times already. Two, both of my dads were fighting, <laughs> right? Because those are the two teams that I backed in uh, in Season 1. Since, you know, there wasn't a Chicago team at the time, and there should be in Season 2, and if there's not, you know, hiatus. <laughs> uh, but anyways, uh, you know, I, I love the fact that they're basically going to a coach that basically just was one of the reasons that they were just outclassed pretty much every time that they were going up against one another. So mm -hmm. I'm really anxious to see the mindset that Shane is going to have coaching a team that he's had a lot of success against. So, you know, Maybe he sees something that the Dynasty coaching staff prior couldn't tell. Uh, but in regards to, you know, changes, obviously we have the free agent signing window coming up that will be opening on September 7th. Uh, so we should be learning a lot in regards to roster acquisitions within the next few weeks. But for now, it's basically just players negotiating new contracts with the current teams or if they're going to get released, things like that. But all in all, like, the coaching staff for the Dynasty is shaping up. I, I'm i curious to see how KDG does, since he doesn't have the experience at the highest level. But then again, with this being as new as it is, as it is, like, not a lot of coaches out there are going to have that sort of experience that these teams might be looking for. So... You know, there's a lot of expectations on coaches, and, you know, you and I kind of talked about, like, well, what sort of example does this set for uh, the the uh, the London Spitfire coaches if none of them have really been able to keep a job, despite, you know, the the amount of success that they had and turnaround that they also had within the same season? Yeah, it's, you know, it's interesting to see what the Seoul Dynasty are doing. I actually, all right, hot take. I see a, one huge change coming up, and I think it's going to be a player going to the Seoul Dynasty that is probably a bigger surprise than Fissure. And I think it's going to be one of two people. It's either going to be Carpe or Libero. And here's a, there's, I have actual reason behind that. Um, with the Fusion, you have an amazing player coming in in Zachary who plays almost the same healer, uh, same hero as carpet. You're you need to find space for him on your team and not bench him. You could get something back. You could get, uh, you know, I mean, if they do a traditional one V one trade, you could get somebody like Ryu Jae Hong onto your team. By trading them carpet. Like, in all honesty, you probably could. Or, you know, reversely, Libero, they could just let Libero come to the Soul Dynasty because, I mean, look at the DPS that they have coming up for them. Like, I think I think this is the, the coaching changes that they did is an amazing first start for the Soul Dynasty because they needed to gut everything that, that they did mm -hmm. coaching-wise. And I think they're not done yet. I think they kind of want to do a full rebuild. And that means getting some rid of some of the old guard. You know, and you see that with, like, Fissure coming in. 
Like, you know, Fisher coming in is is huge for them. You know, you, you saw Ray Jae Hong. He's so popular and people love him. But they didn't, he wasn't even like out there on every map as the healer. Like they used him as a healer. They used him as a main tank. I mean, he's just somebody that they could probably end up parting ways with to bring in more talent. I think you stick with Fleta. I think you bring in another DPS that could be Libero, who is basically, hey, what hero do you play? Um, all of them. And pair him with Fleta, and then you can bring out, between those two, you can bring out something different on every map. And with this coaching staff, they will be able to do something like that. Because that's one thing you saw with the Spitfire. The Spitfire often sometimes had unique rollouts. Um, and I think he's going to bring that over. So Soul is going to be the team to watch for next year. Uh, outside of the, the four, possibly six new teams we're going to get. Uh, which we should be hearing about soon because I think September 6th or 7th is when they can start signing people. Mm -hmm. But uh, as far as like London Spitfire with their coaches are, is like the head coach of the London Spitfire left them to become an assistant coach at another team. It Again, like what we said last week, it just screams what the hell's going on with the Spitfire. Well, like, to, to a point though, I wonder if that was Fisher saying like maybe Fisher really enjoyed what Shane was doing on that team and maybe Fisher specifically told him hey like this is the guy that we want to help with this restructure yes yeah, so, but if you do that you want him in there as like I don't care who you are if uh, some guy wants you to come on your team you don't leave as the head coach of the Overwatch League champions to be an assistant coach on a team that didn't make the playoffs like as as a coach, you're not being like, "Hey, I'm at the I'm the top coach in the league right now. I'm gonna be going down to a team where they're in the middle, and then I'm gonna be going down further because I'm the assistant coach." You know what I mean? Like, if he was the head coach of you know Soul Dynasty, totally understandable. It's just there's there could be some conflict there where you know he may come in and be like. Well, this is how we did it when we won the championship last mm -hmm. year. But he doesn't have the power to implement stuff. Because the head coach actually has the power to implement stuff. He kind of just has to give his suggestions. So it'll be interesting to see the dynamic and how well they get along. But, I mean, overall, I think this is like digging in too much into the dynamic of how the head coach and assistant coach will work together. So, you know... I, I like it. It's it's gonna be good. It it I think overall it allows the Soul Dynasty to if you bring in all new coaches, new GM, all that fun stuff, it allows you to it gives you like a, a built in excuse to blow up the roster if need be. I, I do I do just want to note though, um Bishop Pryor was the head coach and they let him go after that. Um I don't think they actually gave in a like an official head coach spot, but they did have three coaches. I just, I don't know if there was a set order or not. So they might've all just been working together. Uh, okay. To just do different roles. Uh, but I don't well, think that's, they actually, that's different. Yeah. I, I don't think they actually put like a head coach title at that time. Uh, but I, I might, we, we should look into that just to see if it is like a lateral move or a step down. Uh, yeah, because like if that. he was like splitting coaching duties with two other people, mm -hmm. he could see this as an upgrade. Right. Like, in all honesty, like, you could see this as a challenge that gets him to, but like, if you're an assistant coach who's uh, a team that well, with all the new teams coming in, I mean, I feel coaches are a hot commodity as more so than the actual players. Just because, like, there's more players out there than people who coach the game. You know, so, like, I mean, Jane is a coach for the, the Dallas Fuel now, and they found him on Twitch. Like, just doing analytical stuff. Like, 
if you prove if you ever want to get into the Overwatch League, don't get good at playing the game. Get good at coaching the game. And you're gonna you're gonna get into the Overwatch League because right now they're just trying to find coaches. That's all they're trying to do. It's find coaches, enough coaches to train and teach the people in the sport. So Absolutely. So moving on, uh, we do have a little bit of an update on something that kind of like went down during the All-Star weekend. And that is that now we have another talent takedown coming up tonight, even. That's why we're starting earlier. Uh, so if you're hungry for more talent takedown, well, you're in luck because it continues in just a couple of hours. Uh, so, you know, we got a couple of adjustments in regards to the rosters. Uh, well, mostly people not being able to compete. Uh, so for the Atlantic Division, returning we have Mr. X. Doa, Bren, Malik, and Golden Boy. And then for the Pacific Division, we still have Puckett, Monte Cristo, Hexagrams, Reinforce, and Zoe. Uh, so these matches will be streamed live on Twitch tonight at 6 p.m. Pacific time uh, on, you know, the respective Twitch channels of the casters and analysts. And I'm going to be on Puckett stream primarily because, one, I know he's been streaming quite a bit, and two, he's really been the one advertising this, so... It makes more sense for me to show him the love as opposed to, you know, some of the other uh, people that are doing this. So, for the Pacific, uh, you know, Reinforcers are going to be looking to do what he did in the All-Star Weekend. But luckily for the Atlantic, they do not have to worry about Side Throw because Sideshow is on a plane. Uh, so that's one less thing for them to worry about. And also Uber won't be there to lose the main tank battle. So, who knows? Maybe it'll be a different story this time. Maybe the Atlantic Division will be able to one-up the Pacific. Who knows? Maybe they might pull in an Overwatch League main tank to try to combat Reinforce. I don't know what's going to happen, but I will definitely be tuning in tonight. And, you know, we, we saw how entertaining the talent takedown was, which we'll talk about here in just a little bit. But are you surprised that we're kind of getting a redux already so soon after we just had the All-Star Weekend? Yeah, I'm actually super surprised about this. Like, this is awesome. Like, the most entertaining thing about the All-Star Weekend was the, you know, the talent showdown. It, it was, hands down. And to know that they're doing it, like, it's just something they kind of put together on their own. Because honestly, a lot of these guys are probably have just downtime. Like, there's no Overwatch League. We don't know who's casting any of the the Overwatch World Cup stuff because right now it's not any of them. I mean, it was um, it was Jake and uh, why am I drawing a blank on his name? ZP. ZP. So it was ZP <laughs> and uh, and Jake doing the last World Cup. So honestly, these guys have like six months, <laughs> five months. Of, like, just downtime, where it's like, all right, what do we do next? Guests on podcasts. That's what that's what they're hey, doing. Hey, I could totally reach out to every single one of them and try and get them on the show. Mm -hmm. I have no shame. <laughs> I will be like, get the hell over here. Absolutely. I feel, like we could get, I feel we could get at least one. If not a lot more. Okay. So anyways, so yes, that is returning tonight, and just an update in regards to contenders, uh, we do have a couple more regions that will be wrapping up here shortly, so tomorrow, or is it two days, it's weird time, so China is at 4am uh, on, what, what, what day is this? So we have the semis on Friday, uh, so we got that going on. I know Australia will also be wrapping up this week, as is South America, uh, and I know there's been kind of like some roster adjustments in South America with teams disbanding or just losing half their roster. South America, uh, you know, that was the region that had some scheduling issues uh, where Blizzard had to change a lot of things because the times that they had said initially were hours where, you know, people would either be at work or in school. So they had to, like, do an overhaul on that. Uh, so some of these other regions are wrapping up. So definitely check that out. And uh, we do have... Uh, Hold on, I'm trying to think. Oh, it's actually the Land Story Cup. So it's not China. But Australia, South America, wrap it up. Check that out if you're interested in that. And I know last season's Australia champs are still in the run-in. That being Sydney, drop bears. Uh, and you can see some of the Brazil 
Overwatch World Cup representatives compete in in the semis because they are on Brazil Game and House. So keep an eye on that if you are interested in the Path to Pro scene, or if you just haven't had a chance to check out, you know, any Path to Pro stuff. The playoffs are honestly just the best time to do that. Uh, so show some support and some love for you know the tier two scene, and hopefully, you know, we'll be seeing some of those players competing in the Overwatch League at one point. But Let's go ahead and let's move into our main discussion for this week, which, of course, is going to be all about last weekend's All-Star Weekend. So, we had a number of different series. We had the Lucy Ball Showdown. We had what you and I were looking forward to, the 6v6 Mystery Heroes. Uh, mm -hmm. We had the Talent Takedown. We had a Widowmaker 1v1 Tournament, Lockout Elimination. And then, of course, on that Sunday, we had the official All-Star Game. So first up, you know, we had the Lucio Ball Showdown. For the Atlantic team, we had Mecco, Ark, and Poco going up against the Pacific team of Gajiri, Fate, and Fisher. So Pacific, you know, they came out with the strat of, you know, we're just going to put all tanks on our roster. We'll see how that one goes. That did not look the best for the Pacific as Atlanta took that 1-2 games to 1. And really, like, the surprise to me, for one, like, Atlantic had the only, only Lucio player on the field. Well, in a sense that he actually plays Lucio, not not the fact that they had other heroes on the field, because you can't do that because it's Lucio Ball, and they fixed that bug a long time ago where, you know, you could randomly spawn in as a different hero. Because mm -hmm. uh, that, that was always fun, seeing a Torbjorn turret just killing people. Uh, but I was shocked to see how good Poco was at this, considering that, kind of like across the board in most cases, a lot of the pros haven't really played like these oddball like arcade modes, which I thought was kind of interesting, but go figure, you know, they're just as good at this as they are in, you know, legit play. So uh, <laughs> I thought that was pretty interesting, but you know, the real life frog of Gagiri was not enough for the Pacific team to overcome the Atlantic. So Atlantic was ahead in the overall series, one to nothing. Uh, but all in all, like, Lucio Ball is fun. I'm not going to say, like, it was the best in regards to, like, a spectator-type thing. Uh, no. all, all I know is, I know Gagiri plays with a very high sensitivity, and you could definitely see that in this mode, but it was a lot more obvious when she was in some of the other modes. Uh, I remember at one point, she was on Reaper, and the camera was on her, and I just got super nauseous because she was all over the map. Yeah, it's, you know, the Lucio Ball was fun. It was basically the Poco versus uh, Fissure show. Mm -hmm. Like, that's basically what it came down to. Atlantic had a, an amazing comeback, because I didn't think they'd, they'd sink that shot towards the end. But all of them were like, yeah, we don't play. And you know what? I don't believe any of you. <laughs> I call bullshit. Like, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Like, I don't play Lucio Ball. And it would show because I wouldn't do half the stuff that any of them would do. And I wouldn't even know how to do it. So, like, no, you've played. You may not have played it a lot, but you've played. Um, you know, Poco went off, which, you know, so be it. But, yeah, no, they've all played this before. But I, there was one trend throughout the whole thing. What did you guys do? We didn't prepare. <laughs> be like mm, again you're lying to us because you probably did prepare so yeah I mean it was fun but I agree it, it wasn't the best uh, spectator type of thing and I, I hope next year they take it out like if they were to get rid of one thing get rid of that and maybe extend the make the 1v1 Widowmaker bigger. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely talk about potential changes that we'd like to see, uh, you know, as we go along this. Moving on, we had the 6v6 Mystery Heroes. Uh, so for the Atlantic team, we had uh, Team Korea plus Muma. Uh, so we had Libero, Mono, Gesture, Fury, Bedosian, and Muma. So, you know, Muma, the sole non-Korean player uh, on Atlantic. And then for the Pacific, we had Kareev, Ryo Jehan, Sunba, Bishu, Custa, and Space. So this one, again, went to the Atlantic Division. Two games to one. Uh, with both of their wins, uh, you know, all these were played on control, so uh, both of their wins were shutouts on control. 
haven't taken Ilios and Legion Tower. And, you know, you and I, we play a bunch of arcade. You know, we always yep. talk about how, okay, a lot of this is going to be RNG. You know, if we get our main heroes, that's great. If we get Hanzo, I can carry, but only in Mystery Heroes. <laughs> um... <laughs> And if we get, you know, quad tank, chances are we're just going to bull right through the opposition because that is very hard to overcome. Yep. So throughout this, you know, we got to see a couple of cool things. Uh, we got to see Ryuji Han playing some DPS, right? We saw him on Tracer doing some pretty good stuff. Uh, his Doom Vist was really good, mm -hmm. which was crazy, but he eventually did get shut down. But he had a very good streak there. Uh, but across the board, you know, like... When I saw the Atlantic lineup, I was like, "There, there's no way this team can lose. They just have too much diversity in these hero pools, and a lot of them are flex players. And they have a very deep hero pool just across the board, so I was very certain that Atlantic would win it, and sure enough, they did. Uh, but, you know, we, we saw at times, uh, you know, the wackiness of, you know, we had Wrecking Ball paired with five supports, which actually did pretty good. Uh, despite not having the greatest, you know, damage output, you know, despite, you know, a certain thing that's going on with Wrecking Ball right now, which I know you wanted to touch on, uh, <laughs> and I, I just thought it was interesting, though, because, like, a lot of times we're like, okay, sometimes we're just, we're not going to be able to overcome the, the RNG, right? Mm -hmm. That was the same case for the pro players. <laughs> they were just dealt with the cards that they got, and sometimes, you know, you just, you're not able to make a hand out of it, and you have to just reset and on that you know we we also saw some players <clears throat> zumba try to reset not knowing that you know if you jump off the ledge you just come back as the same hero so i got i got a good kick out of that <laughs> i did too I, re I saw that i'm like oh yeah no that doesn't happen they fix that because i used to do that all the time Mm -hmm. And then they fix it. I'm like, oh, you bastards. Uh, I did like when uh, Custa, Custa was on Bastion, mm -hmm. I believe it was. That was a lot of fun. Uh, just to get my rant about the hamster out of the way real quick. Um, I'm so glad that they nerfed hamster um, well, by fixing a bug. Yeah, a nerf doesn't fix the bug. They fixed the bug. So if you didn't know the bug, it was when he pile drived onto more than one target. It did not matter how far away they were from where he landed. They all took the same damage, and they're supposed to be fall off. So if you were at the max distance, you were taking the same amount of damage as if he landed right on top of you. So that will be fixed once the PTR goes live, so once we get the new map live. Um but yeah, no, the Mystery Heroes was everything I expected it to be. Like, it was just pure chaos, pure fun. Like, uh, it just proved how awesome this was for all the pro players. Because they just, they didn't care. They were just having fun. Like, Ray Jae Hong was on Doomfist for how long just wrecking people. Mm -hmm. And like, and, and they realized that some of them were realizing it where... You know, it's like, okay, I have my alt. This is not the best time to use it, but I could die in two seconds and lose my alt. I'm going to use it now. And and that's how Mystery Heroes is. Is like, you use your ultimates as soon as you can, because in an instant, you could lose the ultimate and get a new hero. So, yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. It was It was a highlight, but like you said, the Atlantic Division weird how they never thought about all the planning or anything like that yet they sent out like the best team i don't know how that works you know all these flex players i don't i don't know like it, it i feel they planned about it planned it out and and thought about it despite what they said yeah, and you, you gotta feel bad for Muma in the sense that he had no way to communicate with his team during this. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, was it him or was it Custa who was like, I had a 15-minute crash course in Korean backstage before the show. I'm good to go. I, I can't remember between the two. It was, one, it was that, that, one of them. <laughs> that would happen in quite a few situations given uh, how many Korean All-Stars there were uh, across both of these teams. Uh, but, you know, as we would expect with Mystery Heroes, because it was on control, we did have a little bit of snowball added in, so, you know, definitely hard to bring back to the point with all the, you know, the randomizing going on, especially when someone had the ult advantage. Uh, so what you would expect to see happen definitely did happen. 
Uh, and, you know, I love Mystery Heroes. I just wish that players paid more attention to who is, like, the problem on the opposition. Because a lot of times people are just like, yeah, whatever, right? Like, this person's getting some kills. But then they don't try to actually, like, get them out of the way so they don't actually build towards it ultimate. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's kind of like it's kind of like the same case in like deathmatch too. You know, a lot of people don't really even bother to look at who's on the top, so they don't try to prioritize killing them. You know, things like that. Uh, but all in all, I actually I really love the the mystery heroes. That one, I really hope they bring back, and I really hope they bring back the talent takedown because you know, leading up to this, we talked about the trash talk that was going on. We we read some of the lines, uh, you know, kind of leading up to the build. And this did not disappoint. For me, this was the All-Star Weekend. <laughs> yep. So, for starters, you know, we had Golden Boy, uh, and we had Puckett kind of, like, doing their own announcements for their respective teams. Uh, so, for the Atlantic team, we had Malik, Sideshow, Golden Boy, Mr. X, Doa, Uber, and Bren. Malik was actually playing with a controller on stage at the LAN. Uh, which was not a surprise, you know, I, I I was telling people, yes, he's a council player, like, I think he said he was even top 500 at one point, uh, I don't think that necessarily should, especially with his Zarya play holding on to it for what felt like six minutes. I mean, he <laughs> held on to that in, like, two and a half AKM blades. Yeah. Pretty much. Like, <laughs> that was, that's extensive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you you don't want to hold on to it for that long. But when he did use it, that Space Dragons resulted in a team kill. So at least it worked. Because if he held on to it for six minutes and then got absolutely nothing for it, he never would have heard the end of it. Uh, but on the Pacific side, we had Reinforce, Crumbs, Zoe, Semler, Monte Cristo, Puckett, and Hexagrams. And... We have to talk about the Pacific team in regards to their entrance, right? So Reinforce, he comes out, and he literally carries <laughs> his team across the, you know, across the entranceway towards the stage. He didn't do it for everyone, you know, but I thought that was funny because, you know, everyone at the desk was like, oh yeah, you know, he's, you know, he's just getting ready for what he's about to do in-game, which... Definitely was the case. Like, we're not going to deny that, which you would expect. Uh, Reinforce did a lot of heavy lifting. Uh, so in the game itself, we started on Kane's Row. Uh, then we went to Watchpoint Gibraltar with both games actually going the way of the Pacific team. What? Not what we were expecting at all. Not, not the team that had the pro player on it. Nope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Funny how that works out. The team that had the pro player ended up winning. But... Yeah. We saw a sideshow, you know, he ended up throwing, as expected. Uh, you know, Uber was losing the main tank battle against Monty, which was kind of a surprise. But right? there, there is a caveat to that, in the sense that once Reinforce got moved away from the Sombra, which wasn't really accomplishing anything, uh, the Wrecking Ball came out, and he just barreled through everything in his path and opened up literally the entire map yep. <laughs> for the Pacific team. And they, they, they didn't know what to do. And I just, I love seeing that. Like, it, it was funny, though, because, like, leading up to this, you know, the the Atlantic team was, uh, they were doing a lot of scrimming. You know, they were doing, you know, scrims against randoms. And they were trying to get that practice in, trying to go up against high-ranked main tank players so they could try to combat reinforce had he made the the shift off of dps and that did come but all that preparation still resulted in an l <laughs> yeah no it's it was it was kind of crazy so like you know yeah reinforce that they were losing and reinforces on dps and then all of a sudden he's like well maybe i should switch to some form of tank and then oddly enough the pacific is just like hey we're gonna win now like you know no knock on monty but it's i mean reinforce on tank is reinforce on tank mm -hmm. he's a pro tank player uh pucket played really well on doomfist uh i i did enjoy that Zoe wanted to do anything but play mercy <laughs> 
But she was on Mercy the whole time. And she walked uh, away with the MVP. Which, it's... Alright, her walking away with the MVP is like XQC winning the MVP at the World Cup. Like, she was the fan favorite. She was also Mickey's was, favorite. Yes. <laughs> but See, Mickey, Mickey, had, Mickey speaks for all of us. <laughs> Mickey had a little bit of a crush on her. A little bit. Um, you know, so... But... It was one of those things where there was a lot of good play, and there was a lot of bad play. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of bad play. Uh, you know, sem bombs mm -hmm. is uh, is the new thing. Like that's like his bombs uh, kind of kept him in there towards the end. If I'm not, if I'm remembering correctly, yeah, I mean, like it was a week similar... ago. Like I remember he got his 4K or whatever. He had a bunch of 3Ks at the bomb. end there. Yeah. Hunter yeah. Yeah, so like he was really doing well with his placement, but like, yeah, it was just the Pacific was all over it. The best was after someone won a map, the taunting, mm -hmm. like just I <laughs> just the chairs go flying, and the trash talk starts. So yeah, we get we did get to see the Brenji. The Brenji, while it was not phenomenal did not carry the team it, it had it had its moments but then it also got shut down so it was it was a mixed bag for the brengi <laughs> yeah the brengi is not a bad brengi but you know i mean we did see we we also didn't get to see hexagrams get fully tilted mm -hmm. like normal only like semi tilted it's because they were winning yes <laughs> He but didn't, like, he didn't yeah, have to go like, full Chicago. Yeah, he didn't have to go full tilted because they were winning, just only half tilted. So yeah, uh, but it was it was probably it was easily my favorite match of the whole thing. And they need to do this as often as possible, like tonight. <gasps> boom, boom, boom! <laughs> Imagine that. Uh, so all in all, definitely check out the talent takedown. Uh, you know, Mister X, I would say was. The, the standout for the Atlantic team. Uh, you yeah. Know, Sembler and Puckett definitely had their moments for the Pacific. But obviously, you know, reinforced it a lot of the heavy work. And you, like, even, like, in between the maps after they won Kane's row, reinforcers, like, guys, just 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 pick whatever, you know, I'll win this. <laughs> like, he just didn't care. Just, like, everything was in his hands, and there was just nothing the Atlantic team could do about it. But I was happy to see Hex playing like all the different roles so you know flexagrams was out in full force which i was happy to see uh but all in all like the trash talk you know it the build to it was fantastic the trash talk in the middle of it was fantastic you know the comms were amazing when we got to hear them uh kind of like in between the maps uh so looking forward to 2.0 tonight with the talent takedown and i'm expecting the same results because you know reinforce Assuming that they don't stick another Overwatch thing main tank on the other side, he's just going to do what Reinforce does. And mm -hmm. just, you know, have his way with that team. But moving on, let's talk about the 1v1 Widowmaker tournament. And, you know, for me, I, I, I felt kind of conflicted on this. You know, for me going in, this was the thing I was looking forward to the most. My issue with it was the longevity of it. I felt like the score to 7... And the score to nine was just too lengthy. Um, I want to see them cut down on it a bit because for me the pacing was just too slow. Uh, but all in all, like it did deliver. We saw a couple of upsets. Uh, my pick did not win. Neither did mine. We we did not get either of the uh, the finals that we were expecting, which is great to see. But my favorite one out of the lot was actually not the one I was looking forward to the most. You know, I, we were both looking forward to Carpe versus Saya player. That one delivered. Uh, but for me... Oh, totally. For me, my favorite one was Sure4 versus Soon. But going through the bracket, we had Carpe defeat Saya player, 7-6. to six. Striker defeated Pine, 7-6. to six. We saw Soon defeat Architect, 7-5. to five. Sure 4 defeated Fleta 7-5, and then moving into the semifinals, we had Carpe defeat Stryker 7-3. Sure 4 defeated Soon 7-6, which for me, that was that was my favorite one out of the whole tournament. Uh, and then in the finals, we saw Sure 4 defeat Carpe 9-6, to 
to win it for the Pacific Division. And I have to say, like, you know, Carbe, I... He was a safe bet. And sure he for, was. Sure for had to get shit done, and I was happy to see it. But man, like... It, it was so weird seeing, like, how everything at the start was, you know, really close, and then Stryker just got completely dumpstered against Carpe. And part of that, let's be real, was uh, Stryker having some issues kind of staying on the map. <laughs> that was great. Like, oh, that was so good when he fell off the map. Like, I personally wanted, you know, Carpe to run over and, like, give him a hug after he fell off the map. Like, oh, God, it was so good. I just, yeah. Like like you said, so Pine, once you saw the, the first Striker versus Pine map, you were just like, all right, Pine doesn't give two fucks. Mm -hmm. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't dropped the F-bomb here in a while. Beep. Um, he, he just didn't care, really. He didn't. Um, it, it, was, it was one of those things where you could just tell. And you knew Striker was going to win. So Striker won the Saya player versus Carpe. Carpe should have lost. Yeah. He should have. Like Saya was up I think 3 nothing. And like he I think he felt pressure and then it all came back. And then you know to get soon to get the battle of LA soon mm -hmm. or sure for that was awesome. Um I, it's just, and then soon versus Shirt Four was just such so good, so much fun to watch. Um, but yeah, just to see, even in the finals, I was like, all right, Carpe is good, and to see Shirt Four come back, mm -hmm. oh, it was great. I think the one thing that none of them were expecting is, and we didn't get it till the, like I think the last map of the Saya player Carpe is. After a certain time, you see your enemy. And I don't think they were expecting that. Because, like, after the, the Saya versus Carpe map, where it only did that once on the last map, you started seeing, like, three three of the maps would go to, all right, we can see the other person. We're just going to hold off. And it's a matter of who can, you know, hold out the longest or who wants to be the most aggressive. So that was an interesting mechanic to the, all that too. But yeah, I loved it. It was it was really good. Yeah, and uh, what what I really loved about uh, the Sherford versus Carpe one in particular was we we saw so many different approaches to how they were playing it. You know, they weren't taking the same angles. They weren't going the same path. Uh, you know, sometimes they would go for the cheeky, you know, shots where you know they would try to grapple. Uh, you know, kind of off map at times in some of these series, and go for the headshot that way, which didn't always work. Uh, but you know, we we saw the that Widowmaker, you know, crowd spamming, dancing, you know, turning the head, so you know they couldn't get a headshot because it was headshot only, and that was that was definitely something to behold uh, from a viewing standpoint, and that that was also kind of one of the reasons why I didn't want you know these series to be as lengthy as they were, just because that is a lot of movement in such a short amount of time. <laughs> and if I was having issues with it, I'm sure some other people uh, were as well. Uh, but all in all, like, the Widowmaker 1v1 was great. Um, I It's hard to say if I'd prefer a 1v1 as opposed to, like, something with FFA DM, where maybe they just eliminate, like, the bottom X amount of players and just have more of the Widowmaker players in it. Because, you know, we didn't get to see... All of the best Widowmaker players in this, but we did get quite a few of them. So I just like to see them expand on it just a little bit more. And if they stick with 1v1, just scale it back to maybe, you know, first to five and then first to seven for the finals uh, would probably be a good way to do it. Uh, but tons of fun with that one. But moving on, we had the lockout elimination. Uh, so, you know, lockout elimination, basically, you know, you have a 6v6. If you win, those heroes are taken out of your pool. So you have to, you know, use other heroes. And then for the Atlantic team, this was a another case of uh, all Koreans with uh, one person that doesn't speak Korean, uh, that being Poco. So we had Sibyolbi, Prophet, Gamzu, Poco, Ark, and Jonak. And then for the Pacific, we had Sleepy, Agilities, Kareev, Big Goose, Mickey, and OGE. So this one, 
uh, was a three map set, and it went two to one in favor of the Pacific. And we saw Oasis, we saw Necropolis, and Castillo. And, you know, we, we got to see, like, sometimes, you know, they were holding certain strats for, you know, their last win. Or game point, basically. You know, there were instances where we saw, like, a full dive comp come out at the very end, which we don't always get to see. Uh, but for me, like, this is one of the arcade modes that was just... For me, I've never been a fan of this mode. Primarily just due to the fact that when you're playing on these elimination maps... There's really not a lot of room to move around, especially 6v6. Uh, so if they do stick with this mode in the future, I want to see them do, you know, maybe one of the control points that's opened up. Because uh, there's just a lot more space to work with there, as opposed to just being, like, uh, like clumped together on both sides and, you know, not being able to flank and things like that. Uh, mm -hmm. So for me, this one wasn't one I could really invest in overall, but I was happy to see the Pacific continue that win streak that they had go in. And, you know, you have to thank the uh, the talent takedown team for the Pacific who really started that and it kind of carried over. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm 100% with you on this. The lockout elimination is just not something I got behind. Like, I want to say, like, I can give an, an analysis on this, but I... I don't remember much of this. Like, I remember bits and pieces of it, but, like, it was on in the background type mm -hmm. of thing. And, you know, it's just, it's not something I remember them keeping, you know, typical lockout fashion. Hey, let's save Mercy for the end. Cause, so we can have a res. Uh, stuff like that. Um, you know, so it's it's just one of those things where, this is, if I was to get rid of one thing outside of Lucio Ball, it would be Lockout Elimination. Um, I, I don't like the gameplay. I don't like the, you know, the strategy behind it. It's just, it's still like, okay, we're going to run this. We're going to run this. We're going to run this, mm -hmm. you know, type of situation. So, and it can drag out. It can really drag out. So, I don't know. I wasn't a big fan of this. And I can't go too much into detail because, honestly, I lost interest with the lockout elimination. Yeah, I definitely hear you on that. Uh, so, to wrap up the All-Star Weekend, we had the official All-Star Game, uh, which was a five-map series. And, you know, like, I, I keep remembering them saying, like, it was a best of five. Was that actually the case, or was the plan always to play five maps? Because, like, when we yeah. look at everything else, it was, like, with the league, like, it was always, you know, you would still play all of the maps, regardless of what the score was. Mm. I just don't remember if they actually noted if that was still going to be they, the case. They were saying, I don't remember them saying it before the the All-Star game, but I remember them saying, like, during the broadcast that, hey, no matter what, we're playing five matches. Gotcha. Like, plain and simple. I remember them saying that. So, um, at least we had that to go on. To go with and i'm glad they did even though the fifth map was kind of a womp womp <laughs> of of all the maps it was like it was the most regrettable map but you know the so this the whole all-star game was kind of a all right i mean cool it's i mean you saw the players not care and just have fun with it and do whatever mm -hmm. but then at the same time you also were like well can you take it semi-serious right i mean for the most part they were basically playing what they would traditionally be playing which to me I, i'm kind of against i'd rather see them doing different stuff and being more nonchalant about it i want to see like you know the the bastion symmetra strategies or you know the turret placements, you know, things like that. Uh, but, you know, we did get some good things out of it. So I, I know you ragged on the Route 66, which was Met 5, but to me, like, I love seeing people come out with the six stack of all supports and seeing if they could pull it off. Spoiler alert, yeah. it did not work for the Pacific Division. Uh, and then it after that, you know, they're like, okay, new plan, we're going to come out, we're going we're gonna to stack all the tanks together, and we're just going to try to, you know, move as one, as, you know, one beefy, you know, clump of bodies. That that didn't work either. Uh, mm -hmm. But what we did get 
was Ilios, and for me, that was a map that completely made the All-Star game, because we had the most effective Nano Boost target we have ever seen in-game, and that is the Nano Boosted Torb Hammer. Yes! Like, if, <laughs> if, if you were to take one thing away from this weekend, it is that we had a Torb Hammer kill. And Captain Planet pointed out during the stream on the little did you know that is Torb's first hammer kill in Overwatch League history. Mm -hmm. So got that going for you. Yeah, and that like, uh that that honor went to Fury of the London Spitfire, yeah. and then the person getting hammered down was Gagiri from the Shanghai Dragon. So you know. Shanghai was in the history books uh, for a lot of not so great reasons, you know, since, you know, they went 0-40. Uh, uh -huh. And again, you know, Shanghai on the wrong end of history yet again. But w what I loved about it was the fact that they tried it more than once. You know, I for sure thought like after they had the first Nana boost that, okay, they're, they're going to shy away from it. But no, they stuck to their guns and they eventually got it to work. So I was happy to see that because I was not expecting it at that point. Yeah, no, it was one of those like, all right, they got it. What do they do now? <laughs> type of things like, okay, well, they're, they're going to go for it again. They're fully committed to this. Mm -hmm. All right. Fair enough. Good for you. You know, I, I mean, we saw a bunch of... Like, this whole thing was just about silly shenanigans. Uh, I mean, Sebeobi playing with the keyboard on his stomach. Mm -hmm. uh, Sebeobi purposely... First off, purposely, air quotes, falling off the map. I'm pretty sure he did that on accident and then was just trying to cover it up. Mm -hmm. that he accidentally uh, rolled off the map on his own. So, but like, it's it was just like you said, it's all about having fun. Um, I would have liked them to take it a tad more serious, but not too serious. Uh, like, because I love the, hey, we're going to nano boost Torbjorn's hammer. Mm -hmm. Like, that was really cool to see. But like, to see them be like, Hey, let's do six supports. Like, okay. Now you're just trolling. Like, <laughs> so I, I mean, to each their own, but it was still fun to watch. I enjoyed it. Well, you, you know what else we got? We actually got Symmetra play. You know, we saw Pine. Pine was actually the first one to play Symmetra in the Overwatch League, like, legit. And then we also saw it from Muma, who you mm -hmm. would expect to see it from. You know, if Muma was going to switch. The, the Twitch chat would have been all over him. Like, he mm -hmm. never, they never would have let him hear the end of it. So I was happy to see that. Uh, so we got to see a little bit of Symmetra 2.0 in the Overwatch League. Now, granted, it wasn't in a, a game that really meant all of that much. But if the past weekend proved anything, it's a fact that the Overwatch League ne needs to take a page out of the talent takedown and bring that banter to just to help build up Yep. You know, certain matches or rivalries, you know, we always talk about sports rivalries and, you know, how we, we don't quite have that to an extent yet, just because Overwatch League is still so early on. Obviously, like, right now, really, the biggest ones are, you know, teams that are in a certain territory. You know, we have, like, the Battle of LA. We have the Battle for Texas, you know? So you have Dallas and Houston, obviously both LA teams. And then, you know, you have the story of, uh, you know, New York versus everyone but you know that played out uh in a way that we wouldn't expect uh but you know korea still won uh but all yeah. in all like we we need a certain uh a certain more edge really we just need something to bring more entertainment and more build uh so we have more reason to tune in every week and that's not to say like i wasn't tuning in every week or every night because I was, you know, I watched pretty, I watched every single Overwatch League game throughout the season, including, you know, the All-Star Weekend stuff. But for a lot of people, they they don't have the reason to be fully invested, and I felt like if we got something like that, maybe it would pique their interest more. 
uh, as opposed to just being like, you know what, I'm just going to follow my team and I'll tune in specifically for those matches. So, you know, I, I feel like having that banter and that more lighthearted nature at times is going to help uh, with that sustainability in regards to overall viewership throughout the season because there were a lot of times where, you know, we just saw like a huge fall off and whether that was because, you know, some matches were meaningless uh, to an extent based on records or because we were playing on an old patch, which is going to be, you know, probably another thing that they might be looking at going into season two. Uh, you know, th there's some things that they can do to help alleviate some of the concern in regards to viewership. But that being said, you know, I'm not concerned with the viewership. The numbers were great, even if we saw some dips. Uh, but, you know, expectations compared to reality, you know, the reality was they completely blew it out of the water from what they were expecting. So uh -huh. already, you know, it's a positive sign. And, uh, you know, hopefully it will only improve from here as we are getting more teams into the mix. Yeah, no, like, well, for starters, they did blow it out of the water, um, uh, plain and simple. But I agree with you on the banter situation. Like, one of the things is, like, the closest comparison to pro sports that I think the Overwatch League has is the NBA. And the NBA has really embraced, because it's more of a, it's less of a team sport and more of an individual. And, and the Overwatch League, as much as they want to say it's a team, when you only have six people, there's there's certain individuals that that you really get behind that are really good, and that's who you follow, and and they can make the most impact, aka Fissure, Fissure going to the Gladiators, like so on and so forth. But like, get those individual players out there on social media, and they can make the biggest impact. They can do the trash talking, you know. Sure for I love you, sure for. You're too GD nice. <laughs> yeah, and we saw that, like, every interview that he had. Like, like he had the opportunity, dude, and he's like... Talk some shit. Like, he did nothing. I'm sorry. You just took down Carpe in Widowmaker 1v1. It's not the time to, you know, talk up the rest of the field. Like, mm -hmm. no. Flaunt your stuff. Like, be like, I'm amazing. You all suck. Yeah, easiest game of my life. Easy clap. Like, yeah, <laughs> like if, if if he would have walked up and just been like, "Oh, how was your match?" Easy clap, and then just walked away. Mm -hmm. Best thing of the whole All Star <laughs> game. But like, they need stuff like that. They need to like talk to these players because it's not like something you can like just hope somebody gets to be like. You actually have to be like, "Hey guys, you know, we want you to be more active. Do more." talking about your upcoming matches, stuff like that. A little wink-wink, nudge-nudge type of thing. You know, because I'm sure the casters are, like, talk, and they talk with marketing and talk with all them. And they're like, yeah, this has gone great. Let's just keep doing this. So if we start seeing more of that, that'll be great. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it, it kind of... so. Okay, so looking at Apex, so this is the best thing that I can compare it to. Uh, so Apex, which is, you know, the Korean, uh, you know, Overwatch scene, which eventually became Contenders Korea, what Apex did a lot of times before the matches took place is they would basically have, like, these uh, player introductions or, you know, interviews uh, where they would essentially talk about the other team and just trash their counterpart, essentially, and that really helped build to the matches. They need to do mm -hmm. something like that to just add more depth and more build to just the overall story that way it's just like you're just not like okay so this is you know the the outlaws versus whoever for the umpteenth time like because after a certain point like you're gonna start to lose interest especially if things uh if like the storyline of that match kind of like plays out the same way throughout the season so we, we need something else to kind of like fight back if you know, there's really nothing else going on in that series. So you need a reason to have that investment, and that banter and trash talk is definitely going to help with that. Mm -hmm. Like, have the the new... I, I'm not even going to try and pronounce it. The new China team. And uh, have, like, their star player come out and be like, you know what? All we gotta do, win that first match. Best team in China. <laughs> 
<laughs> right? Yeah, it just it just get that get that sewn in early. You know, like you you know the week before Dallas versus Houston plays, you interview Taimu and like, hey, what a what of your upcoming matches are you looking, you know, are you worried about the most? And be like, oh, we're worried most about the following week's matchups, not this week's. It's it's those subtle digs that just kind of will will help build it. And, you know, and that's something marketing teams can just really drive home with the players is like, you know, we don't want you to go out there and be like, oh, this specific player, you're horrible. You're trash. We don't want you to do that. We want you to talk trash about the team as a whole. Like, you're, you don't want to call out, because people don't want you to call out individual players. They want you to call out, like, teams and build, like, the build up the team versus team mentality. You know, so, like, the Dallas versus Houston. That's a great one. I mean, obviously, the big one is the two LA teams, but that's because they're in LA. Like, once they're out of, all out of LA, the Dallas versus Houston... Uh, Boston versus New York, Philly versus Chicago. Um, yes, Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> Atlanta versus probably the Mayhem. Yeah, you know, like and stuff like that. You're gonna start to see those those kind of rivalries, kind of like you do with college football or in the NFL, and that's what you really have to start building towards is like those kind of rivalries. So. I, I really hope that they kind of do a little bit more of the trash talking. Really do. Absolutely. Uh, but anyways, guys. Oh, one one other okay. thing. If they don't do it, I am more than happy to do it. <laughs> Just say there you go. I, yeah. will, I will I will I will swear all, I will I will trash talk any team at any moment. I excel at this actually so you know what bring it on yeah we're just gonna rebrand our twitter account to just bash in the overwatch league teams uh yeah, in between yeah. advertising <laughs> yeah yeah exactly that's that's how we do it like all right i feel if we had a chicago team it would be like that anyway because mm -hmm. every week we'd just be like hey hey dallas fuel do you have a full team this week? Somebody suspended? I don't know. Can he keep us informed? You know, Absolutely. just just the subtle digs like that. All right. Well, with that being said, guys, we're actually going to go ahead and close out the show for tonight. So if you guys want to help us out, one of the best ways to do that is to leave us a positive review over on iTunes. You know, we're always looking for ways to improve the show and just make for a better listen experience so if you guys have any suggestions on some content that you would like to see we are all ears we have overwatch recall that is our overwatch overwatch league and path to pro uh podcast directory and you know every sunday night i release you know full episodic listens of all the content out there and we have a twitter handle for that at ow recall and uh we actually have our second podcast episode of overwatch recall up where i interviewed big fish from Game Watch Today, formerly known as Overwatch Today. Uh, so I had a good time with that. And, uh, you know, we, we, we got to talk quite a bit about uh, meme specialization. And, you know, how all these teams are looking at, uh, you know, hiring certain designers specifically for memes. Which uh, still baffles me that that's actually a job that people can get. And I absolutely love it. Uh, but Like, I want to know out. what they get, what job they get after that. Like, what did you do? I made memes. <laughs> really? Are you going to list that as experience? Or what's going on here? I, I feel like it would be more... some. It's still going to be social media related. To what extent, I don't know. Oh, but yeah, that would no, be no, the no. obvious you would do, you would, you would, You wouldn't put on a resume meme specialist. <laughs> you would, social you would media do manager. So, social media something or another. Mm -hmm. And then... And then it looks acceptable. Right. Because <laughs> otherwise they're going to look at that and be like, the hell Get is the hell that? <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like uh, me applying for ESPN. Oh, what was your, what did you do before this? Oh, you know, I was a podcasting specialist <laughs> for an esports, you know, sport. Mm -hmm. Be like, um, 
you can leave out those doors. Right. So. <laughs> but anyways, getting back on track, you can find Overwatch Recall on our website at owlnshow.com slash weekly recall. And, uh, you know, you can just find it in the menu and also find the directory also on our website. Uh, so, you know, just look for that. Tons of great content out there. You know, it's not just us. Although some weeks, you know, there have been more, you know, kind of like general Overwatch podcasts and some esports ones. So I'm, I'm curious to see if that trend is going to shift now that we're kind of in between stuff. Uh, but that's besides mm-hmm. the point. But, Ed, you know, we got a ton of ways to get a hold of us. So why don't you go ahead and let our viewers and listeners know where they can find us on the social media. All right. Well, you can reach us on email at hndoverwatch at gmail.com. Uh, you can reach us on Twitter at, at hndoverwatch, which we will be trash talking all sorts of <laughs> Overwatch League teams. Uh, not really. And you can reach us on our website at owlnshow.com. Uh, we are presently live on Twitch at twitch.tv slash owlnshow. We are a Twitch affiliate, so you can support the show by subscribing to our Twitch channel unlock, and unlock our network emoticon. So thanks again to everyone who's been watching our shows live and interacting in the chat. If you'd like to catch us live, we broadcast two nights a week. Uh, Monday nights at 7 p.m. Pacific, you have the Overwatch League Network. And then Wednesdays, at usually at 5 p.m. Pacific, we have Heroes Never Die, this show. We're a little early this week because we want to watch the you know, talent takedown part do. Yeah, you know, electric, you know, boogaloo. Boogaloo. Or whatever the heck it is. Yeah. <laughs> and then we also have a host streams held on Fridays and Saturdays at 7.30 p.m. Pacific normally. Uh, so we have Spider Friday, Totem on Saturday. And we don't always play Overwatch sometimes. I think, you know, we'll play World of Warcraft. Cause... Yeah, Druid runs, yes. Druid yeah, runs. So yeah, <laughs> presently we have, what? No, Ren, we need Ren to level up his druid. Mm-hmm. We have three druids right now that we're going to run dungeons with. And God help us, because I'm tanking. So <laughs> we're going to die rather quickly. But, you know, come watch all that. Uh, we are on Discord at discord.me slash and show. And then we also have a YouTube channel, the Overwatch League Network. So we are getting actually super close to our custom URL. We're only at three. We many? need three. Just three people. Three three <laughs> people to get our custom URL. So it's not like 578Z24R <laughs> to find the Overwatch League Network. So if you can help us out by subscribing to our channel, we greatly appreciate it. Uh, all our podcast episodes, uh, top plays, other videos can be found there. You can reach me uh, reach me personally on Twitter at, at Edinar Overwatch, where I guarantee once the new season starts, I will start trash talking. Uh, T- Totem, where can they find you? Well, I am over on uh, the Twitter sphere that is at the uh, Little Blue Bird at Only Drunk CTR, where, you know, I generally talk Overwatch, scary movies, you know, Troll Blazing Bob. You know, the usual. I mean, that's pretty much an everyday thing in currents. Uh, but anyways, guys, that is going to do it for us here tonight on Heroes Never Die. Again, this has been episode number 126. I am totally drunk, joined, as per usual, by my co-host, Edinar, and we will see you guys back on Monday for Overwatch League Network. But for now, guys, have a good night. Have a good one. Thank you for listening to Heroes Never Die. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at HND Overwatch and join us on Discord at discord.me slash OWLN show. Yeah, I've-